Security Council members that abstained from that vote include Ethiopia, which argues the timing is not right given attempts to revitalize the peace process in South Sudan. The U.S., however, maintains ending the flow of weapons is the only way to stop the violence in the country, arguing that previous ceasefires have been repeatedly violated. We are in a very critical juncture in the peace process in South Sudan. The high-level revitalization forum has made notable progress, and for the first time in a long while, there is some hope for a possible breakthrough. The parties have already reached an agreement on security arrangements, and the reports from Khartoum are indicating that they are closer than they have ever been to reach an agreement on governance issues. The goal of this resolution is simple. If we're going to help the people of South Sudan, we need the violence to stop. And to stop the violence, we need to stop the flow of weapons to armed groups and that they're using to fight each other and to terrorize the people. Stop the weapons, stop the violence. It is a resolution that everyone on this council should support. Indeed, a difficult and a divisive issue at the Security Council. To discuss this further, we're now joined by CGTN's Liling Tan in New York. Uh, Liling, of course, the UN Security Council, some might say, is uh, seeking to exert its influence on the fledgling peace process in South Sudan. What more can you tell us about the arms embargo decision today? Well, this was more of a compromise among Security Council members than it was a unanimous decision to exert itself over the South Sudan conflict. Now, as you mentioned, it was pushed by the United States. That is correct. Um, and it was voted in favor by nine countries. But a lot of uh, intensive negotiations occurred before Friday morning's vote here at the UN Security Council. Uh, negotiations that changed the language so that the vote could pass and so that it would address the concerns of some of the Security Council members that were uh, had previously expressed a lot of uh, uh, concerns about the need for an arms embargo at this time. Now, as we have it now, there is the ban on weapons, including ammunition, uh, paramilitary equipment, uh, military vehicles, as well as assistance on, uh, on the technical and, um, and financial aspects. So this goes into effect and will be in effect until May next year. Now, the U.S. had, under the Obama administration, pushed for this arms embargo from two years back, but that was previously defeated in the Security Council. The sense now among these council members is that patience is running thin over the inability of warring factions in South Sudan to reconcile or seriously engage in a peace process. Among the six countries who abstained, and bear in mind there were no objections or no vetoes, this was an abstention by six countries, including, as you mentioned, Ethiopia, which is, of course, a neighbor of South Sudan, but also permanent Security Council members, China and Russia. And the, the broad contention is that um, any kind of punitive action right now, sanctions, arms, embargo, would be counterproductive to the political peace process. But U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley pointed out uh, that ceasefires have been violated, and as we've been seeing uh, in news reports, even the latest peace deal of June, of late June, has been violated with both sides accusing each other of uh, violating that cessation of hostility. So really the message here from uh, the Security Council as a whole in passing this resolution is that enough is enough. Well, indeed, as you mentioned, Ethiopia was one of those countries that argued that sanctions at this point might work against the peace process in South Sudan, a legitimate argument uh, indeed. Um, but considering, as you say, that this is a compromise, that this is evidence of patience running thin, what should we expect from the UN going forward? Well, now that uh, this resolution has been adopted with renewed sanctions, uh, two new individuals added to the blacklist and the arms embargo, the UN as a whole, its 193 member nations, need to now implement and enforce these sanctions as uh, 
sanctions systems or regimes uh, work here with the UN and with its member states. But bear in mind too that in addressing conflicts like, like what we're seeing in South Sudan, the UN has two key approaches. One is a political track and the other is the punitive track. So we have the sanctions already and now the UN, which has as a system, has long supported uh, a resolution of this conflict and will continue to do so on the diplomatic front. So it will continue its supportive and uh, mediative role through its mission on the ground known as UNMISS, as well as through the Secretary General's Special Envoy, David Shira, who basically leads the, the UN's, uh, represents the UN's me uh, mediation role in this conflict. So we have the political track and, of course, uh, the diplomatic track that the UN is actively engaged in. Mm. All right, Lilling Tan, thank you so much for that. Joining us there live uh, from New York.